Want to find out what's going on in your community? El Observador is San Jose's bilingual weekly newspaper. Go to your local newsstand and pick up your free copy today. Looking for the training and skills you need to get a new career? Call Center for Training and Careers today. That's CTC at 408-213-0961 and start building your new career today. Whoopi Lee Rose Amador LeBeau, and this is Native Voice TV. Welcome to the show. This evening we have with us Dr. Miguel Eladio. Welcome. And he is the Director of Cultural, Diversi Cultural Competency for Santa Clara County Children's Services. Is that correct? That's right. Well, welcome. And one of the fascinating things I find out about your life is that you're from the Amazon. Tell me about your tribe. Yes, Ro, thank you very much for your kind invitation to be here. It's an honor to be here and to discuss with you about my own journey here from the Amazon to uh, Silicon Valley, as well as to share uh, what we are doing uh, at the Office of Cultural Competency um, here in Santa Clara County um, to make sure that you know our children and youth have the right to um, have the opportunities and have a dignified life. That's right. Well, you're doing a wonderful job so far. Thank so you. tell me about your childhood. Well, and uh, I belong to the Shipibo Cornibo Nation. Uh, we are around 35,000 people uh, in the eastern part of the Amazon, which is um, uh, near the border with Brazil. You know, Amazon rainforest uh -huh. is, um, is, is, is a region that composes different countries, you know, Peru, Brazil, Bolivia, and Venezuela, and Colombia, Ecuador, and um, uh, Su Suriname, and Guyana. Uh, where around um, thousands of native peoples live. You know, we have been living there uh, for almost, I mean, some anthropologists say that we have been there for almost 16,000 years ago right. we arrived there. Right. And uh, so for me to be here and uh, talking with you about it's a great honor. So uh, I grew up as a monolingual uh, person. I uh, only spoke Shipibo, my native language. And uh, when I was 11 years old, I had a dream. I had a dream that someday I wanted to learn Spanish, and also someday I wanted to learn the, the language of the white people, the missionaries, mm -hmm. because they have arrived there in around 1940s. Um, uh, they brought, uh, you know, Christianity. They also brought um, bilingual schools. They also brought um, health posts uh, for our communities. Uh, but I also had a third dream, uh, which was that I wanted to um, someday to come to the land of the white people. And I also had the desire to someday um, become a minister, a preacher. Mm -hmm. So with those four uh, visions and goals uh, in life, I left my tribal village, came to a Hispanic town in the jungle called Pucalpa, where I was um, living and working, you know, as an 11 years old boy, sort of mm -hmm. lost in the, you know, uh, in the big city of, of, of the middle of the jungle. And, uh, but I learned Spanish quickly. I went to high school there, finished high school. And, and then you were by yourself? Yes, I was by myself. Oh my goodness. Yes, I was working as a janitor for a Hispanic family mm -hmm. in exchange of food and board. You know, I was determined that I wanted to, to go to school, I wanted to learn Spanish, and I didn't care what it really um, um, cost, you know, in terms of sacrifice, you know, uh -huh. leaving my family, leaving my own, you know, tribal safety, because, you know, in the village, you know, we were surviving by um, fishing, hunting, and mm -hmm. gathering, no electricity and uh, no running water, mm -hmm. but to come to the city was a huge contrast, you know, oh because we had to, you know, I had to live with a Hispanic family, you know, sort of detached from my family, and, uh, you know, uh, in our standards, you know, it was a violation of a child's rights because we're not supposed to work until we are, you right, know, 16 or right. 18, but I was working because I loved school. I wanted to learn. I wanted to, to do something different in my life. Tell me about your life up to 11 years old. 
Um, you said your grandfather was a tribal leader? Yes, in my your grandfather, village? whose name was uh, Manunima, he was uh, a, a village healer as well as a leader. And uh, he was uh, in charge of making sure that our community members, you know, were um, uh, healthy, mm -hmm. you know, and emotionally and mentally and physically, you know. And so whenever people were sick, they used to go to talk to him. Mm -hmm. He had the knowledge, you know, um, uh, herbs and plants, and uh, he would cure them. And so he, he was a great resource, you know, for the people. But nowadays, things are changing really quickly because of the... Uh, deforestation in the Amazon, you know, the contamination with um, with mercury because a lot of mining going on in the Amazon. So all those factors are threatening our uh, lifestyle in in, in, the, in the Amazonian region of Peru, but not just in Peru, but in Brazil and uh, Venezuela and uh, Colombia, Ecuador. You know, the Amazon is threatened, as yes. well as its people, our people, my peoples are threatened. So and uh, so those are some of the major consequences, you know, of the contact. Uh, and the impact of, of this, um, um, you know, contact we had with mm -hmm. the outsiders. Mm -hmm. So he was basically like a medicine man for your village? Yeah, so my far grandfather was, uh, gr my great grandfather mm -hmm. as well as my grandfather was a medicine man for, for the village. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it sounds like the the contamination and the you mentioned the mercury, it's the same thing that's going on in a lot of the reservations in the United States. Yes, the the yeah, the problem that we have in the Amazon, you know, the usurpation of native lands, you know the um, inclusion of uh, of of you know foreign uh, colonialists, you know, uh, national colonialists uh, who are uh, coming to our villages. I mean, it is a very typical problem that we have all over the world. You know, in their South America or Central America or North America or or, or um, in Africa and Asia, you know, native mm -hmm. peoples are suffering all over the world. Yeah. I think it's really great, you know, for us to be talking about these issues and how. I mean, this suffering, I mean, can be reversed. I think all of us you know, have the opportunity to do that. And I think this program is a great opportunity to bring this awareness. And so I congrat congratulate you for this program that you, you have and uh, you know, to make sure that our uh, viewers um, uh, can understand what's going on. And not just to understand, but how they can be can part of it. You know? Absolutely, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of people just don't know mm -hmm. You know, they mm -hmm. hear about things going on in other countries, and they don't know what's going on right around them, yes. you know, with, mm -hmm. with Native people. Um, so th th in your village where you came from, I'm sure a lot of the kids didn't, because of your drive, you became a Ph.D. from Stanford, graduate mm -hmm. of Stanford. Mm -hmm. But how many of the kids actually finished school? What does their, um, their future look like? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question, Rose. Um, so, you know, for me to be talking with you in Silicon Valley, you know, and uh, having had the opportunity uh, to uh, get three uh, graduate degrees from Stanford, it's a great honor because uh, I always mention that, you know, for me to have that opportunity is, you know, I basically had zero probability to be where I am right now. I mean, given the fact where I come from, you know, with no opportunity, zero opportunity, zero education opportunities, zero economic development, zero language opportunities. Right. I never went to any academy to learn Spanish or English. And I learned by myself, you know, and I think, but Sally, you know, my friends from my uh, village and other villages, and they do not have the same um, chance, you know, and so the question is why? Why was it, you know, God chosen me? Why did the universe, you know, has chosen me? Mm -hmm. I think that I don't understand that, but the thing I do know is that I have the privilege, you know, to have this great education. But along with the privilege, we also have a great responsibility. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, after I came here when I was 19 years old, uh, with the sponsorship of a friend whose uh, name is Patrick Parks, He's, uh, he was the chief of police from Petaluma, California, which is a, you know, a city mm -hmm. north of here. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, teaching a course on security in Peru. And we um, connected is through uh, music. Uh, he plays, you know, guitar. I play f uh, native pan pipes and flutes. And uh, when we were talking together after we played the music, he asked me what I wanted to do, and I told him that um, I wanted to come to the U.S. someday to go to school. And he said, "Look," he gave me his card. And he said, "Look, I believe in you. I don't know you, but um, I want to help you." So a year later, this stranger, uh, you know, basically. Um, 
uh, sponsored me both financially and legally to come to Sonoma County. Wow. So that's how you know sort of my life begins here in the U.S. But prior to that, you know, when I finished my high school in Pucallpa, uh, the city uh, in the middle of the jungle, uh, I left Lima uh, to, to Lima to um, to come to study theology. And while I was there, I didn't have any money, so I, were on, I was on the street basically for three years with a couple of friends of mine, you know, eating leftover food. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one of the things we used to do, for instance, was that around three, four in the morning, there was a local Chinese restaurant. Um, there, La Senora Maria uh, used to throw away the food. So around three, four in the morning, we used to go, you know, get the food there and uh, eat leftover Chinese food. And I still love Chinese food <laughs> today, you know. <laughs> and so anyway, so I, um, was there in Lima for three years, um, working as a janitor again, and uh, while I was attending uh, theological um, school uh, for three years, and until you know Patrick Parks uh, sponsored me to come to Sonoma County, and so while I um, while I was here, you know I was, you know, eager to study. I was, you know, having part-time jobs, you know, and uh, flipping burgers here and there, and. Uh, but I studied very hard. I went to Sonoma State University where I studied um, um, political science and economics. And, uh, and later on, I had the privilege to um, get a scholarship from Rotter International. And um, it was around $23,000 to study in any um, part of the world. And since I have studied you know, political science, I've read the biographies of many uh, you know, people who have made history. Uh, I found a common pattern there. That was that all these people went to Oxford. So I was like, you know, Oxford must be a good university, so I'm going to apply to Oxford. Mm -hmm. So I applied to Oxford and um, got into Oxford to study politics and philosophy. And uh, while I was there, I had the opportunity to bring the voice of the native peoples mm -hmm. and their plight, you know, their struggles, you know, against uh, the government, the struggles against, you know, um, uh, the pressure that comes into your lands, both spiritual, cultural, mm -hmm. and ecological. And uh, after that, you know, I came back to um, to California, um, as you just mentioned a minute mm -hmm. ago. I had the privilege to be uh, admitted to Stanford to do an uh, MA in politics, then uh, later on the PhD in anthropology. So from then onward, you know, I've pursued uh, my international career with United Nations, as well as with um, Inter-American Development Bank as a specialist on the rights of women and the rights of children and native peoples. So making sure that in any policy that, um, that the governments adopt or any kind of policy that in, uh, international institutions adopt, native peoples are included. You know, the women are included, children are included. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've been doing you know, in the last few years. And um, so I came back you know, uh, here to my second homeland. Uh, mm -hmm. This is my community, this is my homeland, uh, this is the country uh, and the county that gave me so much. And I'm really honored to be back here. And when I saw, you know, the opportunity to, um, to come to serve here, uh, you know, our people as a director of cultural competency with Santa Clara County government, I applied and uh, I was given the honor to, to come here as a director of cultural competency so, and, uh, so that I can uh, be a bridge between the Santa Clara County government and our communities, both Native Americans and uh, Hispanic, you know, uh, Americans as well as um, and, uh, African Americans. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, those communities are the most underprivileged. And Rosa, this county, Santa Clara County, has a GDP of 180 billion dollars. When you sort of sum um, summarize, when you sort of sum up the GDP of all the um, um, Central American countries and Caribbean countries, they don't even reach to that. Mm -hmm. And we only have 1.5 million people. You know, I think the county is privileged to have you here. It's the other Thank way you. around. And we're very fortunate to have you here. Thank but you. when I sit here with you, and you're just such a brilliant man, and you. you made your own opportunities, you really struggled and you figure how many of those children back in the village, villages now and when you were there, have those brilliant minds but we don't have access to them? You know, that's a really good point, uh, Rose. Um, there are so many children in the Amazon here, you know, in our county, in, in, in our country, all mm -hmm. over the world, 
who have great potentials, mm -hmm. but they do not have the same opportunity. They do not have the angels who extend their hands to help them out. And I think it's really a, a great opportunity to ask ourselves here. Mm -hmm. I mean, the average income in these countries is $90,000. For minority groups, it's $30,000. Mm -hmm. How can you make a living here if you're making $30,000? dollars uh, a year. So uh, my job is to uh, make sure that our kids you know, have the same opportunities and to also to, to uh, bring awareness that our, ki our, our children, our youth have tremendous opportunities in this county and in this country. Yes, we do have the problems of, of malnutrition, we do have the economic problems, you know, we have by you know, some of us live in bad neighbors. But at the same time, you know, if I was able to overcome the tremendous challenges from my village to come to Stanford, they have more opportunity than I had. So I want to inspire those young people. I want to inspire our parents, you know, that we have to come together. We have to come together in our communities to say, hey, you know what? Yes, things are tough. Things are difficult. But we need to come together. We need to help each other. Sometimes we are disconnected. Yes, we talk yeah. about many times that, you know, that we are disenfranchised economically and culturally and socially, but we do not anything to help our friends, our neighbor. Uh -huh. you know? So I think it is a time for us to say, you know what, what can we do as our community? And what can we do together with our county government? And that's where, I'm, where I come from. You so know? this is a new position, right? This is Santa a new Clara position county? that uh, Board of Supervisors and have uh, approved last year. Mm -hmm. And so this is the first position, actually, in the state of California that a uh, county opens a position like this to tackle the issues of disparity, you know, economic disparity and legal disparity, as well as, you know, disproportionality that um, our children in the foster care suffers, as well as our uh, youth in probation departments. So those are some of the uh, 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 key things we're going to be working on. But most importantly, you know, I'm here to say that at the Santa Clara County government, we are open. We are and, uh, not just open, we're committed, you know, not just from the, I mean, not just from the uh, social service department, not just from the probation department, but, you know, uh, my boss, uh, Jeff Smith, who is a county executive, is committed uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that all people, all children and youth have the same opportunity. And uh, so this office um, reports directly to, um, uh, to Jeff Smith as well as to the Board of Supervisors and so we are, are bringing all the internal stakeholders together in this sense you know the, the, um, the probation department, the social service agency, uh, the district attorney, the uh, public defender and um, uh, the police department and the sheriff and all those important departments that in a sense make policies. Um, for our county. Many times those policies have not been good for, for our children and youth, but we have to change that. That's why we're here. Right. We, are changed to, we are here to change the procedure, the policies and programs that put in a way and disadvantage many times to our kids and our youth. Well, that's one thing that's very apparent in our county is there's an over-representation of Latinos and other minorities in the justice system. That's why you mentioned, you know, um, probation, uh, DA, and so forth, because that's where a lot of our kids end up instead yes. of Stanford and college right. and um, in, you know, good positions in Silicon Valley. They're the ones in the, you know, the justice system, and we have to find out, figure out how we can break that cycle. Right. For instance, you know, in our county, uh, the la Latino youth population is around 36 percent, mm -hmm. yet they're overrepresented in a juvenile hall, 66 mm percent. -hmm. Mm -hmm. For African Americans, they, I mean, our uh, uh, African American youth are around 2 percent, but yet they're overrepresented around 11 percent. So those are the issues, you know, mm -hmm. that we have to tackle uh, uh, with, and at, but at the same time, you know, when we talk about these issues, it's not um, only important, you know, what can the county as a government do? What can our agencies do mm -hmm. in this case, a social service agency, mm -hmm. or probation department? Right. But at the same time, what can our youth mm -hmm. do? You know, so it boils down to individual decision of the youth. 
We need to empower that youth. Yes. We need to provide them the opportunities. At the same time, they cannot be sort of crossing their, their hands and waiting what, you know, can the community do. Mm -hmm. He or she has to get up. I was able to do it right. without the help of anybody. So I want to inspire them. Hey, you know what? You can do it. You know, you can sort of get up from this, from this problem. But most importantly, we need to tell them that he's not or she's not alone. You know, we have to come together as a community, but at the same time for our, our government, we are here to empower them, you know, to make sure that, for instance, you know, probation department is working to make sure that all those kids who are in trouble, you know, they uh, finish their GED, for instance, you know, but we need to think beyond GEDs. Mm -hmm. We need to uh, think about, I mean, your work, you know, at the CTC is a great opportunity to empower them, mm -hmm. empower them so they can go beyond high school diplomas. They can get, you know, some technical degrees, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you know, I, and I, you know, if, if you're here, I mean, if you're hearing me, I want to tell you that you too can go to Stanford. You too can go to UC Berkeley. You Two can go to Yale or Harvard. You know, the only thing that you need to um, think about is that that you need to have a desire, you need to have a dream, and it doesn't cost you anything to have a dream. And that's a message for our young people today. You know, I want them to to think beyond their problems. I want our parents to think beyond our problems. I want them to to believe in something, either in God or either in something. Believe in something, but you need to have that belief in combination with a vision and dream. And having, you know, in putting in action those visions and dreams, you know, things will come. Great things will come. Absolutely. And you're mm -hmm. just a wonderful role model when we talk about, you know, overcoming obstacles and barriers. Because some kids and even adults say, oh, it's too late. It's too late. And I have to give a shout out to Kwasiwa Trinidad, who just got her... Uh, BA from the National oh, Hispanic great. University. Great. She's one of the producers of the show, has been working great. on for years. About a year ago, she got her AA, now she got her BA. That's great. And she's working full time for the Native wow. TANF program. Wow. And she just graduated last Saturday. So, congratulations, congratulations. Kwasiwa. It's yeah. really, you know, and, and that just goes to show you. And she, and I, I don't mean this bad, but she's not yeah. a young kid. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you can do it at any age. Yeah. You know, you started 11 years old going on your own. That's amazing, you know. And, but, you know, kids, they, they, they have the opportunity here to finish school. Yes. They can go to school. Yeah. They, there's, you know, opportunities if they just take them. And that's why I say you're a great role model for Thank our you. kids. Thank you. And what the plans you have for the community is something, it's, you know, we've needed it for a long time. Yes, in this case, um, uh, Rose, one of the things we are doing at the Office of Cultural Competency is that we want to, um, you know, the mandate of our uh, office is to uh, organize, plan, adopt um, programs and policies at the county level, you know, to tackle issues of disparity and disproportionality. And I really believe that the policy decisions um, have to be made uh, from a grassroots level. And that is why we are going to have on the 29th of of May, we are going to have a for Latino community forum on disparity and disproportionality mm -hmm. at CTC, and I would like to invite uh, our, um, um, you know, uh, Latino parents uh, to come to participate because we're going to be discussing discussing about what are the issues you know that affect our communities. What can we do as communities? At the same time, what can we recommend, you know, as a policy to our county government? So this is an opportunity to bring the community voice mm -hmm. to the county government. So I really encourage, you know, our uh, even youth and our um, parents and citizens and professionals to participate in this really important event on the 29th of, of May. Absolutely. Now, you know, culture does play such an important part of people's lives. And I know Native people here, you know, urban Natives have lost that a lot. Oh, we only have three minutes left, yikes. Mm -hmm. But I was just wondering, back at, in, in your village, have the kids lost that or is, it st is there still a strong cultural connection? That's a really good question, Rose. Um, the cultural interconnectedness that we have, it is disappearing. Uh, given the fact that globalization, you know, has been sort of reaching everywhere. And uh, young people are being disconnected with their families. Young people are being disconnected with their communities. And we see that in the Amazon. I see this, you know, the same problem in, in California mm -hmm. and all over, you know, the world. Right. You know, I've seen that, you know, as the, 
UN official before. And, uh, but I think the hope that we have is that, that we need to empower our youth with education, with culture, and languages. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but most importantly, we have to uh, make sure they have a, a dream because everything that we can do in this world begins with a dream and a vision. I think once our young people, uh, once our uh, uh, youth have this vision and dream, and I think that uh, they can you know, lead to the next generation to a brighter future, to a more dignified life. Absolutely, and to keep on dreaming, don't give up the dream. Because sometimes, if things don't work out initially, right. people give up, kids yes. give up, and they say, oh, well, it's too late now, I can't do that, it didn't happen. But you would encourage them to continue dreaming and keep fighting. Right, keep that's the right. the determination. Yes, first of all, you know, they have to have a dream about something. They have to have a vision, and they have to commit themselves to that vision, to that dream. And uh, after that, they need to put into action that dream and vision. And finally, they have to persist. You know, it's tough, you know. The fact that I came from the Amazon all the way to, to Stanford, it wasn't automatic. Right. You know, I worked hard very work. hard. So I want to encourage, you know, our young people that uh, things are tough, you know, things are difficult. Don't give but up. we can make it happen with the help of our friends, our communities, and God. Thank you for being Thank you here. very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Like us on Facebook. We'll see you again next week. Good night.